got coming. Good evening from PAP Public Access Poetry. Tonight we have only one guest. Only is the wrong word to use because he is a very special guest to those of us involved with the show. Our guest was one of the originators of the New York City Poetry Project, now located at St. Mark's Church at 10th Street and 2nd Avenue. And that's the place where many of us met each other. You may know this man from his many articles, both humorous, sensitive, and factual, for many years at the Village Voice. You know, the guy who, because of a traumatic incident early in life, can't use capital letters. And uh, I don't know what more to say, except this is Joel Oppenheimer. Okay. Uh, I, I'm going to read some uh, new poems tonight, relatively new. They're from a, a book which at the present point is called New Spaces. Um, and they're a little bit longer than what I've, a form I've been working in. land, the body maps abound, but I am lost there. Have known yours and yours and yours, I forget them all, not touching them. Have not once remembered hair, not hair I lived with ten years, okay. then eleven. Not hair I see repeated on my sons, not hair I find on collar or in bed. If you remember her hair, she is already an object to you. Neither object nor person, or I would remember something, not even my own body remembered, save in touch. One. Toe, knee, chest, nut is how I wash this body. Two days a week I saw a man to tell my dreams to. That was so many years ago. What I remember is I was always forcing myself into the cellar of my being because instead I wanted to ride always upward. Toe, knee, chest, nut, the game, and song go. I had to learn to go down in those dreams into cellars of my being instead of upward into head and brain and intellect which ordered action. Still cannot bathe from top down as others do, they tell me, while we bathe together. Skin crawls at thought of washing cloth on groin after face, foot after groin after face. I don't know why. Two. Phalanges equals line of soldiers, tarsus equals broad, flat surface, metatarsus equals at the back plus tarsus, cuneiform equals wedge-shaped, navicular, boat-shaped, cuboid, cube-shaped, talus, one of a set of dice, calcaneus, heel bone, all wrapped in muscle, pulled and held by tendons, sinews that we walk by, covered with meat, with flesh, with body that we talk of. The foot supports us as we walk away our lives. Men who spend their lives walking and talking is the way he put it. Wash every bone with care. The cloth poised. The water runs. Three, suspending part of her weight from the bar above, the Japanese lady, much smaller than us anyhow, and smaller still since lady, walks her toes up and down the back. It is the final stage of the massage, and they are fingers on the back are like fingers indeed with much the same construction. Some names are different since they have evolved to different uses. The lady sat right next to the flea circus in the Freak Museum beneath the Penny Arcade. Her arms were folded, visible under her satin blouse. Anything for a hype. It's a living, isn't it? With her feet for hands, toes for fingers, she wrote her name Lefty and then Righty too. Sold postcards for a nickel, signed both ways. Again and again I went back to watch her, wondered what kind of discipline could teach your toes to write when you still had your fingers, what could drive you to it. They are like fingers, and the bones almost the same. Four, itchy feet are not the same as itchy palms. I don't like to walk, 
Travel doesn't interest me, but I've been cursed with itchy feet. If the body contracts what it deserves or wants, what are my feet telling me itching while I sit? Contracted athlete's foot at six while neither athlete nor in want of travel, have ridden with it 40 years or more, have often ripped my toes apart with painful scratching, have often winced and shuddered in the five and 10 when young, when faced with awful posters of some torn up skin between some model's toes yet at night again rubbed and rubbed on bedposts and on frame, with fingers and with nails and with the other foot. Relief from painful itching was often promised. There is no relief from painful itching, save the scratch. Five, this little piggy went to market, this little piggy stayed home, this little piggy had roast beef, this little piggy had none, and this little piggy cried wee, wee, wee all the way home. It is how we learn to count, so that roast beef has always been a special food for me, and so that I always thought it had to do with that last pee to take before bed, and so that I always wondered about the rhyme, how home and none could match the subtle pressure of the culture, as the toes themselves press against the ground to hold us up. Six. One night, desperate, cold, and stormy inside, she berated me I did not know how to make love. I felt her breasts, I rubbed her clitoris, I fondled soft her ass. Perhaps then I nibbled on her ear. Oh, the scornful look. Oh, the refusal. Oh, it's not enough, it's not enough. What of the rib cage, though I knew one friend that loved that? What of the arching back, though I knew one friend loved that? The calves another, the knees another. All parts of the body, someone said, not erogenous. Who said that? It was two in the morning and the fight went on until finally one by one I kissed her toes, sucked them each into my mouth, licked under in the soft and hidden parts, rubbed against the arch. She came then startled and against her will sitting in her chair and we did not fuck. After this one night she resisted my advances. She had learned that her toes were erogenous or my tongue was and she thought she had me beaten. Seven. My own toes grow old and no one will caress them. Now the nails grow strangely curving round the ball of toe, impossible to cut. The nails are thick and hard. All that itching and rubbing and walking and talking and badly fitting shoes have scarred them. Now I love them because they are my own. We love only what is our own or is perfect in our eyes in others. There is no middle ground. I want someone beautiful and melting, as has happened now and then. I will not settle. Only those who move in order to stop moving settle. Others cover up the ashes and move on. Eight. My first lover used her feet as well as head and opened up my pants by toes alone. That also was erotic to a young man's sense. Ah, we were all beautiful once, is what she said as she cut the roses. I had grown enough not to be astonished that she could use her toes so well, though she still had her fingers. Nine. This little pig went to market. Five sons times ten toes is what it comes to, not counting my own. The feet we walk by as we walk by as we keep touching ground, as we keep moving. It was fun reading the line about painful uh, itching on television. Uh, <laughs> The trouble, actually, when I do that, that poem on television, it reminds me that those posters have disappeared probably because of television. But it used to be impossible to walk into a five and ten without those horrible posters. And, uh, and they were always behind the soda fountain. It was terrific. <laughs> like you could be eating a banana split and you were staring at this three foot tall, large toe that had been eroded co completely away by rubbing it at night. Um, all right, here's a shorter poem called The Charm. It's a tarot poem about the card called The Tower. This is a charm for entering the tower. The tower stands carved in ivory, blue skies and white cumulus pile behind it. But that cloud is boiling behind it. Soon lightning will flash from it. Oh, we are all born fools, innocent and smiling. While our dogs frisk at our feet, we walk off the edges of cliffs. 
We fall safely to the plain at the foot of the tower. We look up, it is there before us, phallic, threatening, alluring. That is the day we have to climb it, the dog left behind, the innocence, the smile left behind, even the id surmounted. What happens is in the cards, the cloud boils up covering the sky, the lightning will strike to the middle of the tower, the tower will crack and crumble and start to topple. People fall from the windows again, there are smiles on their faces, halfway up, halfway down, they are falling. You may think this is a terrible card, saying the tower falling presages tragedy. It is a way to move on to new things. It is a way to learn how to survive. It is learning how to live through even the crumbling tower. There are people who survive it. It is only the crumbling of something we've made. I repeat, those falling again have smiles on their faces, a little different from the smiles they had before. But they are smiling again, falling not to their doom. It is the card we must pass through. First, you must enter this tower, the clouds boiling behind it, the storm building up, even with a clear blue sky. Um, this is another poem in sections, a lot shorter than the, the foot poem. I really must move on to the ankle, because I can't bear for that to go through life known as the foot poem. And uh, so that anyone, I, actually, if anyone has any pertinent information about ankles, I'm stuck there. I have lots of material waiting for knees and things, <laughs> but, but I'm stuck on ankles. So. And I, I think I need nine sections for ankles. Uh, this is called Summer Songs. It was written this summer. One, waiting for the afternoon. It comes. It is gone. Two, fruit, flesh, in summer, all the same thing. I taste a cherry. I taste a plum. I taste you. Juices flow. They taste fine. There's no difference. Three, Earth, air, fire, and water on the one hand, scissor, rock, and paper on the other. Earth puts out fire, fire burns up air, air dries water, water covers earth. Whichever of us was wrong holds out our wrist. The other with index and middle finger together and extended wraps smartly. We are children playing this game, but there are elements of reality in it. Four, territory demands we take each other's land with knives. Mumbledy Peg calls only for dexterity and elegance of form. We play one or the other as the need moves us. Territory is ruined if one gives one's land away. Mumbledy Peg fails when one doesn't care. Five. There are differences. In winter, I shower because I want to fuck or because I did. In summer, I shower all the time, as if plunging into the sea had to do with keeping my cool. Six. What I like is seeing you naked. It is almost obligatory in summer, an impossible favor in winter. Suddenly, I do not know which to prefer, except that you are more beautiful than all the blackbirds with their sheeny features. Seven, peaches, plums, cherries, grapes, and berries. Still life's on every table. I take what I am able. Um, the Forefathers. This was um, actually started about two years ago and then just sort of lay there and came together, I think, um, about a month ago. The Forefathers, the first of whom is clouded, is not to be seen but felt in the dark night, is fallow simply, is insertion, jet, Feel him. Later, so much later, feel his skin smell, cigars or sweat, whatever. He is not there. He fills her or does not. Out of him is built. He is dark and inside. Then the second appears nourishing. He yells, shouts, he punishes and loves. He also takes the mother but with deference and is as frightened sometimes as the child. The third father does whatever the second did not and does not do whatever the second did. He tells secrets he has learned and he creates his own mystery since he is there for her but also for himself. 
The fourth father is old, and we think him wise, and we find him a stranger, but we talk. Oh, I have been all of the first three, and soon will be the fourth. Each of the mothers, each of the children know me differently. Each has a different picture folded in your heart. <coughs> it's a commercial for cough. Huh? <laughs> Who I think, uh, is cough going to be reading shortly? Yeah, next week. Next week, cough will be reading. Uh, There's a funny little, that is a strange little poem that I'm using as the, uh, the introductory poem to the book, and it, uh, I call it Around. If in our days we sing of what most pleasure brings, and if we rage, rage, rage when needed in our pages, and the song's a perfect thing, as perfect as it praises, the anger more than staged, so that real fire it raises, we are the masters of the age and of the song, the king. Um, there's a poem that sort of started all this, uh, this line for me, this sort of discursive line that just keeps moving on. It's called Acts. Uh, was written about two years ago. My son and I walk out in this cold October morning toward his school. We hold hands. His other hand holds a penny whistle. He will use it to accompany the guitar in the morning singing circle. At each corner we cross, I am looking for you while he and I walk and talk. I keep thinking we will meet at one of those corners, our paths intersecting, just as the clear note of the penny whistle occasionally crosses a particular chord of the guitar in the structure of some song. I keep thinking, in other words, that there must be a point that we cross in common. And so this morning we do meet and walk together half a block, he and I still holding hands, you next to me on the other side, one small moment for you and me to register ourselves. And then later, after he is in school and you are gone, I drink my morning coffee and read the paper, again intersecting, this time with the world. I read that Hugo Zacchini, the first human cannonball, is dead. I read that all his life he wanted to be a painter and that after his retirement he taught art to young kids. Yes, say for me, he is quoted, that my canon does me much honor, but do not forget to add that it is as a painter that it is my ambition to be known. Day by day, my canon cannot give me the thrills I can get with my brush. Lucky man who day by day, first in Malta, then throughout Europe, then in the old garden, before me, a little boy holding my father's hand, went 150 feet, reaching an arc of 75, where was my father headed? What intersection was I going toward then? A flash, a puff of smoke, a roar, and he would go hurtling through the air in an idea he conceived serving with the artillery in World War I. So I hurtled toward you and toward this poem, aiming for some corner of our lives where we can meet this morning. I do not know whether or not there is a net. It never occurs to me to wonder about it. The flash, smoke, and roar take the forms of an alarm clock and the radio and a small child needing his bottom wiped. Oh, this act also will be carried on by my son just as his son learned to enter the mouth of the cannon. Oh, I also wanted to do something else. Oh, I also learned my methods in some previous wars. Why don't you ask me a question about poetics? What do you think is poetic? <laughs> as seldom as possible. Uh, no, it. Yeah, it just seemed like the reading is just droning on, and that let's break it for two minutes. What's the title of your next book? <laughs> <laughs> um, Commercial plug. <laughs> New spaces, Bob. New spaces. Yes. New spaces, Bob. You added no. one. No. 
<laughs> All right. Um, I worry because I've always, uh, up until this, worked in either very short forms or the long poems have really been long lines and like they've sort of carried that kind of weight. And I get a little worried. I finally adjusted to the fact that these aren't really terribly long poems. I, the longest is about 13 pages, but the, no, except in the titles. But the, the, the lines are very short. So, and they do, I, th I hope, move, you know, so that, so, uh, but I, I haven't gotten used to how, I love the way they read on the page, but I'm so used to reading short poems that sort of punch, you know, or long poems that really sit there like rocks that, yeah, I'm not used to it just rolling on when I'm reading it aloud. This is, uh, this is a poem called Plus Achange. Uh, and it's about, I guess she's gone now. I don't know how long. I'm sure she's not working anymore. Uh, a chimpanzee <laughs> named uh, Lana, who was uh, involved in one of those speech programs where they had her typing out on a typewriter that typed pictographs. Uh, and this was, I guess I first read about her about five or six years ago, so I'm sure they've retired her now. Huh? But they yeah. Have the, they like but yeah. But the thing was that she started writing messages at night when no one was there, oh. and that's—I mean—that's what the poem is about, really, <laughs> because uh, the messages were kind of nutty. I mean, like here were all these idiots running around arguing whether she was imitating things or really thinking and speaking, you know. And well, listen to the poem, plus change. My darling, I wanted to tell you, my darling, I wanted to take the whole line of human thought as we have understood it and wrap it in a ball so you would understand it also. To cry like Sapfo about the moon sunk beneath the western sea lying here on my bed alone. Or say, O oh, western wind, when will you blow so the small rain down can rain? Christ, that my love were in my arms and I in my bed again. My darling, I could not find words, I could not sing either song. I could not trust such things now when we are too tied in to where our heads would like to be. And then, my darling, in the morning paper I found the words, spoken by a chimpanzee who's learned to talk and who types pictographs to record her speech, who is building up her vocabulary against the future. At night, my darling, every night alone in her room she types out sentences, please machine, move into room. Please, machine, tickle me. It's all there, my darling, in those words. Move into room. Please tickle me. I lie here on my couch alone. Christ, that my love were in my arms. I was searching for words. I think they were censoring her with that, you know, having supplied her with tickle. Uh, but she evidently had great tickle scenes with the, her main keeper. Okay. <coughs> well, Shakuna Songu. Um, five minutes left. All right. Uh, there's one one poem I would like to sort of end on, which is. Uh, oh, you've still got five minutes unless you can find them at home. No, it's not. But I want to find that one to make sure that we have it. Okay. Um, let me read Schizophrenia in the meantime. Schizophrenia, a love poem. I go out to buy a garbage can, hand beaters, a steam iron, a stew pot, a double boiler, scissors, and then a new suit and Wellington boots. I am making a new life. In between, I stop to call you. You are angry, and I don't know why the anger spews from the earpiece. I call you again after the boots and the suit. It has eased a little, but you are still very angry. I go on about my new life. I have promised it to myself whether or not you are a part of it. In fact, I think you are scared of this new life and being part of it, and that is why you are angry. It will be weeks until you admit this, but now I do not know and can only guess. 
There is another day when you send someone else to do errands I know you should do, and which I depended on for an excuse to see you and to face that anger if it could come out face to face. By sending that other person, you have made it clear how little there is you can say. Oh, well, I dust my Wellingtons and make them shine day by day, and I continue to plan how and when I might run into you. Um, that was a great shopping day. That was, that was the day I said, gee willikers, I am all alone in the world. And I made up this fantastic shopping list. And I had just, to my astonishment, been issued three, three credit cards in one day. Ooh. I had a fantastic week. The FBI and the CIA sent me letters saying they had no files on me. <laughs> and I got approved for three credit cards. And I thought there was something dreadfully wrong with the country in which <laughs> those five things could happen with me in the same week. Uh, but in any event, I went on this lovely shopping spree. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, Crazy Eddie's came three weeks later. But you know what? He gave me a terrific price for cash, and then when he found out I was paying on a credit card, he jumped it. I, I, if I hadn't been so tired, I would have run up the block to that other guy who has the big sign in his window saying, we will, crazy yeah, we will beat credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let me read for Han Yu, and then if we have time, we'll talk. All right. For Han Yu, after almost 1,200 years, Han Yu was a Chinese poet, circa 750 A.D. People say when your teeth go, it certainly ends near, he wrote. He wrote, but seems to me life has its limits. You die when you die, either with or without teeth. He wrote, this is a poem I chanted and wrote to startle my children. All the while I was reading him, an unfinished draft lay on my desk. The breasts of the young woman from St. Louis dance before him and their nipples rise to his hand and also her legs stretch out, trembling. I wrote, he is 20 years older than the young woman from St. Louis. He was raised in Yonkers and now he is almost toothless. Oh, Han Yu, we don't change, not people like us. We're impossible, the women keep telling us. We're incorrigible, we'll do anything. That was Joel Oppenheimer. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. How are we doing with time? Do we have a couple seconds left? We're focusing on the clock. We're focusing on the clock. No, I could pop How my teeth. How many more seconds do you have? Anyone here? Don't all answer at once. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Next week, we're going to have the Consumptive Poets League on. And uh, <coughs> all you people out there, cough. Cough ladder? <coughs> Cough blood? That's punk. That's not ugly. <laughs> I don't know. How much more time do we still have? We're going, going, gone. All right.